this week's Siskel and Ebert review, Kevin Bacon hijacking Meryl Streep's family vacation in the River Wild. Johnny Depp plays Hollywood's worst director, Ed Wood. And Albert Brooks discovers baseball phenom Brendan Fraser in The Scout. <laughs> Meryl Streep leads her family on a dangerous whitewater rafting trip in the River Wild, one of five new movies we'll review this week on Siskel and Ebert. We'll also see Johnny Depp and Bill Murray in Ed Wood, the story of a very bad movie director who was most comfortable working in an Angora sweater and high heels. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is The River Wild. And here's something different, a thriller that is mostly ridiculous and pointless and only works because Meryl Streep is such a good actress. She plays an expert whitewater rafter who decides to take her husband and son down a particularly treacherous river she once conquered as a youth. But there are problems, big problems. First, she and her workaholic husband, David Strathern, have a lousy marriage. She was gonna skip the trip, but at the last minute, he's on board, at least for a little while. While on the river, Streep and her family run into some more rafters. A couple of wild dudes, played by Kevin Bacon and John Riley. At first, we're supposed to think that Bacon just wants to have sex with Streep, and that maybe, because she's so ticked off at her husband, she's attracted to him, too. What's a river like below Bridal Creek? Rapids are unrunnable, you know. Treacherous. I bet you ran it, though, didn't you? I did. I was 18. And completely insane. <laughs> But these turn out to be very bad guys, and they have their reasons, which I'll keep vague, for wanting to kidnap Streep and her family here, trying to break free. Gary's asleep. I'm gonna get the gun. There are many preposterous scenes in the River Wild, and here's one. Everybody thinks Streep's husband is dead, but actually, he's just injured, and he's gonna hang on the side of a cliff, hoping that only she, only she, will see him. Streep is one of our great actresses, and here's proof as she enlivens a standard confrontation scene. I could bury you in Rourke tonight. I could do anything I want with you. So go ahead. Don't keep telling me how tough you are, Wade. Just show me. Why can't Kevin Bacon kill her? Well, that scene suggests the bully is a closet wimp, but the real reason is that he needs her navigation expertise. So, the scene is a bit of a lie. More ridiculous is the conclusion of the picture, which is just plain silly. And yet I'm giving The River Wild a mixed thumbs down review because Meryl Streep really makes this character compelling. I just hated to see her wasted in this pretty stupid plot. The River Wild is not in the same league with similar pictures, Deliverance and Dead Calm, which I guess are really the standards in this genre. You're right, it is not. And you know, in a movie like this, a great deal depends upon plausibility because we like to believe that the people are doing the things that we would do uh, or that any reasonable person yeah. would do. You're right because about- Because they're smart, because she's but, so smart. In other words, yeah, we, we, we think that would be true. Yeah, and now you picked out the scene where he's hanging on the side of the cliff. There was no earthly reason for him to be there. Later on, how'd you oh, like the smoke the, signals? Oh, please. Wasn't that terrific? And, the uh, finale? And what about, what about the confrontation with the ranger? When the oh, four ridiculous. of them are lined up like this yes. with guns in their back and the ranger never notices anything suspicious when all they had to do was take the kids into the woods with Riley right. and, ha and then the, of course the parents are going to tell the ranger everything that he needs to of hear course. because they're worried about their kid instead of this, this scene that is patently false. Uh, at the same time, I like that character she plays. I would like oh, yeah. to see Meryl yeah. Streep's character taken and put in another movie. She was sabotaged by the screenplay. Yep. Okay, next movie and our next film is Jason's Lyric, a story of romance and violence involving two brothers whose father came back from Vietnam and earned the nickname of Mad Dog while scarring them for life. 
In this scene from early in their lives, Mad Dog, played by Forrest Whitaker, comes looking for the ex-wife he still loves, even though she has banished him from the house because of his drinking and craziness. I got some flowers. I got flowers. I don't want what you got. The boys grow up and take different paths in life. Jason, played by Alan Payne, stays on the straight and narrow. Joshua, played by Bokeem Woodbine, is a criminal who, in this scene, has just ended his latest prison sentence. Didn't you learn nothing in prison? Uh, damn. That's what I learned. One day, Jason walks into a restaurant and falls instantly in love at first sight with Lyric, played by Jada Pinkett. I'll see you tomorrow. Lyric plays hard to get, but Jason is persistent, and the movie's love story is touching and tender. For all I know, you a gangster, and I don't ride with no gangsters. Yo, I ain't no gangster. Apart from anything else, Jason's lyric tells one of the sweetest love stories in a long time, and the chemistry between Jada Pinkett and Alan Payne feels very real. I also like the other story about the two brothers, and the movie is filled with vivid supporting characters, including Lisa Carson as Pinkett's best friend. Jason's lyric tells a lot of story, and it's all effective. I didn't think it was all effective. I like the love story. It is very sweet, and it's refreshingly sweet. Yes, it is. But the crime story, I thought, was way, way over the top. And you just mentioned another thing, problem I had with the picture. Her best friend, the waitress. Now, at one point, we see her as a very self-sufficient character. She tells off bad guys. At the end of the picture, and I'm not really, it's a tiny no, no, point. No, 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 no. She, I know what you're going to say, and I don't think you're right. She explains, she has a whole nice line of dialogue where she explains why she's with this guy and what her options are, and she deals with that. I don't think that, 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 that was not credible to me. But more to the point, I thought that this was very standard, over-the-top cr uh, crime plotting between the two brothers uh, and, and the bad, if you will, the bad brothers' associates in their bank robbery. I thought that really was just over the top. And one other point. This film follows something that we've commented before on the show. Of, in black movies, the light-skinned characters are all good and the dark-skinned characters are all bad. But they're not all good and all bad. I think in a, in a case it's, like it's this, right sometimes you might line. say they got the best actors they could for the roles. Well, that's it. When you like the picture. When you don't like the picture, you've dumped on it. Coming up next, Johnny Depp stars in a movie about a strange man off Often called the worst film director of all time. His name, Ed Wood. What kind of a movie is this? It's science fiction. A heartbreaking romance. Brave robbers from outer space. Brave robbers from what? In past commercials, we've shown you how the Nissan Altima is smooth enough to pass the infamous Lexus glass test. We've shown you how quiet its cabin is. How it's built precisely enough to pass the ball bearing test. And how the Altima can outhandle an Acura Legend LS. What else is there? Except to once again show you our logo. And this remarkable offer of just $750 down and $239 a month. Uh -huh. Hey, is this the line for Super Bowl tickets? No, we're getting yeah. a tan. Good luck getting seats. Yeah, now. we've been here like nine days. <laughs> Mr. Number Three fan. Guy in the back row. Fire of bad seats. Yeah. Captain Binoculars. Captain Binoculars. <laughs> now, buy any McDonald's extra value meal, and for just 39 cents more, you can supersize it for more fries and more drink. Plus, you'll get a super ticket that could win you one of 200 trips for two to the Super Bowl. Just match and win. I won! I won! Free tickets to the Super Bowl! <laughs> what you want is what you get. I have to rub our noses in it. <laughs> Ah, oh, yes, Plan 9 deals with the resurrection of the dead. Long-distance electrodes shot into the pineal and pituitary glands of the recent dead. You know, maybe you guys were right. Plan 9 is a good title. That's Johnny Depp as Ed Wood, an energetic young film director in the 1950s who stopped at nothing to create some of the worst, most laughable pictures of all time. And this movie called Ed Wood, directed by the always inventive Tim Burton, is simply marvelous. It's one of the great movies about movie making. It's in love with filmmaking and the directing impulse. I really like this picture. I think it should be required viewing in every film school in America. And why? Because it's about a guy who loves his work despite all the roadblocks put in front of him. Ed Wood is presented here as a cheerful, decent, slightly weird optimist. I love this guy. Here he is getting ready to direct one of his low-budget specials. And his fiancée, Sarah Jessica Parker, is steamed that he gave the key roles to would-be actors who gave Ed money to get the film made in the first place. I see the usual gang of misfits and dope addicts are here. Janet, I want you straight... Say, who's the lug? Shh. 
I want you staying away from the old Willow's place. Why, that's Tony McCoy. He will be portraying Lieutenant Dick Craig. Really? How much money did he put up? None. But his dad gave me 50 grand. Hmm. Wood production's the mark of quality. One of the strangest things about Ed Wood, he liked to dress in women's clothing. He played a cross-dresser in his first feature film, the cult classic, Glenn or Glenda. And cut! Print that, let's move on. Don't you want a second take for protection? What's to protect? It was perfect. Huh? Ed Wood accepted the first take almost every time. Always saying, it's perfect. He didn't have time or money to waste. And I also think he just loved making any shot. Let's move on. Don't you want to do another take, Ed? Yeah, looks like Big Bowley had a little trouble getting through the door. No, it's fine. It's real. You know, in actuality, Lobo would have to struggle with that problem every day. One of the best parts of the movie is the real-life friendship that developed between young Ed and veteran horror star Bella Lugosi, who late in his life was a drug addict rescued by Ed's undying admiration. Martin Landau is dead-on brilliant as Lugosi. Mr. Lugosi, why are you buying a coffin? I'm planning on dying soon. No. Yes, I'm embarking on another bus and truck tour of Dracula, 12 cities in 10 days, if that's conceivable. Do you know that I saw you perform Dracula in Poughkeepsie in 1938? Ed is so passionate about making movies, he'll do anything to raise funds, anything, even get his goofy troupe of misfit actors to undergo a group baptism so that some wealthy Baptists will finance Ed's science fiction opus, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Bill Murray is one of the troops. How do you do it? How do you, How do you get all your friends to get baptized? Just so you can make a monster movie. It's not a monster movie. It's a supernatural thriller. And wait till you see the loving recreation of Plan 9. Ed Wood is filmed in gorgeous black and white that is a tribute to the 50s and to the black and white movies of Ed Wood. Mr. Wood, do you know anything about the art of film production? Well, I'd like to think so. That cardboard headstone tipped over. The, this graveyard is obviously phony. Nobody will ever notice that. Filmmaking is not about the tiny details. It's about the big picture. This film is just beautiful to look at, photographed by Stefan Zapsky. Ed Wood's movies were so bad, they had to be made by a man who loved his work. They were innocent fun. And this movie called Ed Wood is a tribute to creative passion and also to friendship. I loved every single bit of it. And I hope that it will inspire people interested in making films to follow their dreams and not just view movie making as a way to make money. Congratulations all the way around on this picture. It's one of the year's very best. Well, you know, Gene, I share your delight. And I also enjoyed every moment of this movie. You know, one of the key things in the movie, I think, is the way that Johnny Depp finds the oh, right tone for the performance. Great. Because when I heard about this project, involving this notorious cross-dresser, Ed Wood, who made these terrible films. I thought it was going to be some kind of a smarmy put-down, but actually, right. I didn't take into account Tim Burton, who I've met a couple times. He has a very sweet, optimistic, positive yes. personality, and a lot of that is reflected in Johnny Depp's performance as Ed Wood. I mean, he has, he's such a positive guy, yes. you can't put him down. At one point, somebody says to him, are you a homosexual? And he says, no, I'm a cross-dresser. Yeah. He's just so happy to share whatever it is with whoever wants to talk to him. Uh, a couple of stories. I, once when I started as a film critic, somebody said to me, you know, there's this old story about this uh, producer who would applaud at the end of every movie yes. because he knew how hard it was to get any movie yes. made. Yes. That's the spirit of this picture. And the other thing is, I once had George Lucas tell me, he said, you know, you can divide the directors of the world into those who like people and those who don't. It's an interesting way to think about movies. Tim Burton loves people, and he loves this character. He loves character. people. He also loves monsters from outer space. Yeah, it's a, a wonderful And he work. loves corpses, and he loves vampires. When yeah. we come back, Albert Brooks is a Yankee scout with a troubled new recruit on his hands in the scout. Does he sign on the dotted line right now, make $500,000, go to the biggest city in the world and become a member of the most prestigious baseball team that ever was? Or does he continue his schooling? Possibly trip over a book on the way to math class and be worth nothing. That's one of the hilarious opening scenes of The Scout, a new movie starring Albert Brooks as a scout for the New York Yankees who will tell anything to anyone in order to sign a promising new phenom. 
and I only wish the rest of this movie was as funny as the first 15 or 20 minutes, but unfortunately, the movie makes a U-turn after the first act and turns into a lead-footed melodrama. The screenplay is still funny, though, as Brooks is banished by the Yankees to the backwaters of Mexico, where he stumbles upon the discovery of his career, a kid named Steve Nebraska who can pitch no-hitters and then hit home runs one right after another. I found him. I found him. I found him. I found Cog. I found Cog. Oh, my God almighty. The kid is played by Brendan Fraser, and after Brooks signs him and gets him on the plane to New York, it becomes obvious that things are not going to be as simple as he thought. Do you know the way? Singing a little, little too loud. Singing too loudly? Yes. And talking too loudly. And talking too loudly? Yes. Everything's too loud. You know why that happens? It's because you get the earphones in your ears, and then you can't hear yourself speak. Nebraska is signed by the Yankees, whose owner, George Steinbrenner, plays himself. Here, have a glass. That's six bucks. With what I'm paying this kid, I gotta get it back any way I can. Lots of little touches in this movie are just right, but a lot more are completely wrong. The sharp comic tone of the early scenes gets misplaced as Steve Nebraska goes into therapy and begins to reveal problems that are really deep and serious, so serious that the scout tries to ignore them and deny them until finally this kid is about to come apart at the seams. That's in the long and repetitious second act. Then suddenly the movie switches gears again for the big formula ending. The scout reminded me somehow of an outfielder who has lost a fly ball in the sun and keeps running around in circles trying to find it. I had the exact same reaction, Roger. I started laughing. There's some bright writing here. Albert Brooks, naturally funny. I'm sure he contributed to the script. Andrew Bergman, the freshman, uh, very funny writer, Honeymoon in Vegas. But I think that they didn't find the story so that by yeah. the end, mm -hmm. by the end, I really didn't care whether the guy played ball and no, conquered his no. problems. And that's how it falls apart. Yeah. Uh, ab you're absolutely right. Okay, coming up next, a movie that takes us to the mysterious land of Easter Island and to the people who made those enormous statues of stone heads. Why did they? Rapa Nui tells why. From Hollywood Pictures, critics are declaring Quiz Show the best American movie this year. USA Today gives it four stars. Siskel and Ebert give it two enthusiastic thumbs up. Gene Siskel calling it one of the year's very best movies. Everybody got the answers but you. Quiz Show will win a mantelpiece full of Oscar nominations. If someone offered you all this money, would you do it? It's a sure contender for best picture of the year. Quiz Show, rated PG-13. Now playing in select cities. Check newspaper for showtimes. Maybe no one ever told you that you are a healer. There is no stronger medicine than the power of your words. No touch softer than the sound of your voice. No better remedy for bruised feelings and broken hearts. Introducing Time Bank. Only Time Bank awards you one free minute for every five you spend on the phone. It's about time we were recognized for something we do so well. Okay, earlier on this show, we reviewed Ed Wood, a marvelous movie about a man who made sincerely awful pictures. Well, maybe Ed would have liked Rapa Nui, which mm -hmm. is certainly goofy and assuredly awful, telling a fanciful adventure story about the natives of Easter Island and the South Pacific and the massive stone statues they erected there. The statues were created to appease the gods, and the building process was the means by which the island's leaders kept their subordinates in check. Here, build me a statue. Here's a conversation between two natives, Jason Scott Lee and Esai Morales, about the island's traditional religious beliefs. There are no gods! Except the ones we make up! There's no spirit land! There's no Otumats who are coming back for us! There's nothing out there but sea! In addition to the statue building, there's another island tradition that really forms the bulk of this movie, an inner island race in which the winner becomes the master of the tribe. There's a love story, a dumb one, between one of the racers, Jason Scott Lee, and a girl from the wrong side of the tracks. Doesn't if they had tracks on Easter you. Island. She's played by Sandrine Holt. They can marry if he wins the race and if she can stay in a cave for six months. It's completely dark in the cave. You can't stand up. You can't move. You... 
can do it if you swim. Nothing works in this picture. The statues look fake. The race is ridiculous. They race to steal a bird egg and then have to bring it back unbroken, the kind of stunt that might work at a birthday party for nine-year-olds, but is laughable here. It's all a mess, and much to my surprise, Rapa Nui was produced in part by Kevin Costner and directed by his friend and sometimes colleague, Kevin Reynolds. Talented men, silly movie. You know, Gene, I'm going to have to vote thumbs down on this one. <laughs> I really am. But on the other hand, in the spirit of Ed Wood, there was just something to be said for a movie that has a line of dialogue such as, I'm busy. I've got chicken entrails to read. I know. It's that was a great line. And also the whole mythology of the Cave of the White Virgin, where she has to go in there and stay in there for six months, and then this ridiculous race. And then, of course, they do everything wrong in order to drop the egg. And right. then the difference between the long ears and the short ears. And then the senile old king, who's always you know, kind of confused, and his advisor is shouting, saying, you know, now say, go! And he goes, go! Yeah, and uh, talking also uh, sometimes in a very modern style, Really, too. you know, just push it a little bit more over the top, and this is Hot Shots goes to the Pacific. <laughs> okay, when we come back, our video pick of the week, a Christmas movie about Halloween. Orville Redenbacher created a new bag so more of his big, fluffy, irresistible butterfly kernels could pop than ever before. How much more? Yay! Let's put it this way. You'll notice Orville Redenbacher's new, bigger bag. Make room for it. Now it's time for our video pick of the week, and my choice this week was produced by Tim Burton, the same offbeat talent who directed Ed Wood. The name of the movie is The Nightmare Before Christmas, and it tells the story of Jack Skellington, the most prominent citizen of Halloween Town, who begins to envy the neighboring citizens of Christmas Town because they get presents and have a lot more fun. We pick up an oversized sock and hang it like this on the wall. Oh, yes. Does it still have a foot? Let me see. Let me look. Is it rotted and covered with blood? Um, the movie is made in an unusual and very effective form of animation called stop motion, in which real figures are moved very slightly between every shot to give the illusion of lifelike movement. Reports are pouring in from all over the globe that an imposter is shamelessly impersonating Santa Claus, mocking and mangling this joyous holiday. The Nightmare Before Christmas is our home video pick of the week, and now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs down on the River Wild, with Meryl Streep leading her family on a dangerous river trip. The movie was too predictable and with some major gaps in logic. A split decision on Jason's lyric, which I thought worked as a drama and a sweet love story. Gene liked the love story, but thought the crime story was over the top. Two big thumbs up for the unique Ed Wood, a film that will be especially entertaining for people who like cheerful trashiness in those old B-movies. We love this film, and this film loves the movies. Two thumbs down, though, for The Scout, a baseball comedy that starts funny and goes downhill real fast. And two more thumbs down for the silly Polynesian adventure Rapa Nui, although I admit I felt some affection for the movie just because of its sheer goofiness. And so the real discovery this week Ed Wood. Is, is Ed Wood. That's it for this week. Next week we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including the romantic comedy Only You, starring Robert Downey Jr. and Marissa Tomei. What? Uh, I've got a minute. <laughs> and Pulp Fiction with Bruce Willis, Uma Thurman, John Travolta, and Samuel L. Jackson in a thriller about trigger-happy hitmen and dangerous women. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. While you're watching your favorite movies, let Dynamark Security Centers watch your home. Call Dynamark today at 1-800-448-2891. It's America's favorite jelly bean, Jelly Belly, now appearing at theaters and video stores with good taste. Jelly Belly beans, try and you'll love them. Quit chewing tobacco with Mint Snuff All Mint Chew. Mint Snuff is made from mint, not tobacco. For a store near you, call 1-800-EAT-MINT. Hooked on Phonics teaches you to read using flashcards, music, and books. It's colorful, musical, and fun. Learn to read with Hooked on Phonics. Call 1-800-ABCDEFG. Yeah.